Richard. Um, I think the, I congratulate my honourable friend for bringing this debate forward and I think the timing has proven to be rather apposite given the announcement we know to expect at 6pm uh, this evening from the American President and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But I wanted to start by just focusing on the humanitarian aspect of what we're talking about when we talk about demolitions by reading from a letter from Nasser Nahaira who is uh, the leader of the village council of Sicilia, a village on the uh, east of Jerusalem in the South Hebron Hills. He says that on the 22nd of November 2017, the Israeli state attorney's office announced that within 15 days, they plan to demolish 20 buildings which represent one fifth of our village. This will violate the fundamental human rights of around 100 villagers, half of them children. The 20 buildings are our homes and also provide shelter for our animals. The timing of the demolition in the middle of winter could not be more devastating. That is one of many villages which are now under threat of a demolition order. And of course, it is right that honourable friends have mentioned that, well, there is nothing new to the fact that structures are being demolished by the authorities. Indeed, it has been going on for many years. And the colleague opposite was right to say that in a legal sense, because Israel has administrative authority over Area C, it is right that these structures uh, are built without permission. But it seems to me that that authority is somewhat undermined by the fact that, as my colleague says, only 2% of applications by Palestinians for building permits have been approved in the last six years. Only 2%. So people living in desperation with their farms and houses collapsing and the, the, the desperate need to build new structures have little opportunity but to try and build them unlawfully without permission. And that is the situation that we're facing. And the, of course, that doesn't happen on the other side of the equation. Uh, if you're a, a settler living in one of the settlements and you want to put an extension on your house or build a swimming pool, you have to apply for permission in the same way. And those permissions are granted. So there is a gross unfairness to this dimension. But the thing, and, and, I, and I think what's happening here really is, a, is a, we have a, a situation where from the Oslo Accords, we had the, the zoning into A, B, and C, which was meant to be a transitional phase to a final settlement in a two-state solution, but has now become an impediment to that two-state solution, and in fact, a means of seemingly keeping it more and more distant. And, uh, well, I, I'm sh very quickly. Was he surprised, like me, to hear members comparing planning in this country to planning in what is an occupied country, where the settler enterprise actually takes up 40% of the West Bank? if one takes the totality of it, not the 2 or 3% that is often alleged. Indeed, my honourable friend makes a, a very good point. I wanted to say, though, that the reason why we are discussing these particular demolitions now is because there is a new dimension to this. This is not the same thing as has been happening over many years. When we look at the situation to the east of Jerusalem in that segment of the central West Bank, there are, the, the fact is that the demolition orders that are now in place on these villages are part of a strategic plan in that area in order to depopulate it of Palestinian villages in order to then come in and create Israeli settlements with the distinct purpose of extending Jerusalem to the east into the Malabanin area and creating a residential corridor which will effectively <coughs> bisect the West Bank as it is today. Now the fact that that is part of a strategic plan and involves the forcible displacement and relocation of people who are living under occupation is, many legal authorities say, in itself a, an, an act of violation of international law and it is, as colleagues have described, a war crime. Now, I want to ask the Minister, when he comes back, whether that's his assessment also and whether he believes that what is happening with the forcible, forcible displacement of civilians within an, a militarily occupied area, whether that also constitutes a war crime. And if that's not his view, why not? If it is his view, then what on earth are we going to do about it? Because the problem is this. If these go, if these go ahead, and if those within the Israeli cabinet get their way and bisect the West Bank, it puts even further into the distance any prospect of a two-state solution. It puts a sustainable, peaceful, long-term agreement very, very far beyond the horizon. And that is bad, not just for the human rights of Palestinians, as people have said, that is bad for the long-term security of Israel itself. So there's every reason why we should be concerned and see this as a different phenomenon to what has been happening in the past. 
Let me turn to the announcement we are expecting at six o'clock from the, the leader of the free world. This was trailed yesterday that the American uh, government intends to state its policy uh, as recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. This is a horrendous mistake in my view. Everyone knows that Israel, uh, that, that Jerusalem uh, it has, uh, is, a, is a city of great significance for the, for the three major Abrahamic religions in the world, for, for Islam, for Judaism, and for Christianity. Everyone knows that it's disputed. Everyone has a claim. And if the president genuinely goes forward with this policy, then he will be seen to be taking sides in that debate. And there is a very great possibility that we will see this conflict escalate to more of a religious conflict than it has managed to become so far. And I fear for the region and I fear for the world if that is allowed to happen. But there is another aspect to what the president will do, and that is that there are many people desperately on both sides trying to find a solution, trying to compromise, trying to accommodate each other. And the rug will be pulled from underneath their feet if the president makes this statement and is seen to be so partisan in his dealings with this area. But it creates a further problem, and it creates a problem for our Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and that is this, that until now we have looked to America to be a broker in the situation. We have looked to America to sponsor peace talks, to try and move things forward. Effectively now, if the president takes this action, then he will be absenting America from that process and leaving an international vacuum. And that means, Mr. Pritchard, that this country needs to step up and recognize its historic responsibilities. We need to talk with the other permanent members of the Security Council and try and get a fresh initiative before it is too late. Because this statement at six o'clock is going to take us immeasurably backwards and it's going to make this world a much more dangerous place. That is the context in which we should consider this debate before us today. I'm grateful to the Honourable.